we can put the alternative in another image altogether. And I will call this not the ceramic image, not the fully automatic image, but the dramatic image. Consider the world as a drama. What's the basis of all drama? The basis of all stories, of all plots, of all happenings. It's the game of hide and seek. You get a baby. What's the fundamental first game you play with a baby? You put a book in front of your face and you peek at the baby like this. The baby starts giggling because the baby is close to the origins of life. It comes from the womb really knowing what it's all about, but it can't put it into words. See, what every child psychologist really wants to know is to get a baby to talk psychological jargon and explain how it feels. <laughs> but the baby knows. You do this and this, 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 and the baby starts laughing because the baby is a recent incarnation of God. And the baby knows, therefore, that hide and seek is the basic game. See, before, uh, we, when we were children, we were taught one, two, three, and A, B, C. But we weren't sat down on our mother's knees and taught the game of black and white. That's the thing that was left out of all our educations. That life is not a conflict between opposites, but a polarity. The difference between a conflict and a polarity is simply, when you say about opposite things, we sometimes use the expression, these two things are the poles apart. You say, for example, with someone with whom you totally disagree, I'm the poles apart from this person. But your very saying that gives the show away. Poles. Poles are the opposite ends of one magnet. And if you take a magnet, there's a North Pole and a South Pole. Right, chop off the South Pole. <coughs> Move it away. The piece you've got left creates a new South Pole. You never get rid of the South Pole. Things may be the poles apart, but they go together. You can't have the one without the other. That's the basic idea of polarity. But what we are trying to imagine is the encounter of forces that come from absolutely opposed realms that have nothing in common. When we say of two personality types that they're the poles apart, we are trying to think eccentrically instead of concentrically. And so in this way, we haven't realized that life and death, black and white, good and evil, being and non-being, come from the same center. They imply each other so that you wouldn't know the one without the other. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad. That's fun. You are playing the game that you don't know that self and other go together in just the same way as the two poles of a magnet. So that when anybody in our culture says, uh, slips into the state of consciousness where they suddenly find this to be true and they come on and say, I'm God, we say you're insane. Now, it's very difficult. You, you can very easily slip into the state of consciousness where you feel you're God. It can happen to anyone. Just in the same way as you can get the flu or uh, measles or something like that, you can slip into the state of consciousness. When, when you get it, it depends upon your background and your training as to how you're going to interpret it. If you've got the idea of God that comes from popular Christianity. God as the governor, the political head of the world. And you think you're God. 
then you say to everybody, well, you should bow down and worship me. But if you're a member of Hindu culture and you suddenly tell all your friends I'm God, instead of saying you're insane, they say, congratulations, at last you found out. Because their idea of God is not the autocratic governor. When they uh, make images of Shiva, say he has 10 arms, how would you use 10 arms? It's hard enough to use two. You know, if you play the organ, you've got to use your two feet and your two hands, and you play different rhythms with each member. It's kind of tricky. But actually, we're all masters of this, because how do you grow each hair without having to think about it? Each nerve. How do you beat your heart and digest with your stomach at the same time? You don't have to think about it. In your very body, you are omnipotent in the true sense of omnipotence, which is that you are able to be omnipotent. You are able to do all these things without having to think about it. When I was a child, I used to ask my mother, of course, all sorts of ridiculous questions that every child asks. And when she got bored with my question, she'd say, darling, there are some things we're just not meant to know. Well, I said, will we ever know? She said, yes, of course, when we die and go to heaven, every God will make everything plain. So I used to imagine that on wet afternoons in heaven, we'd all sit around the throne of grace and say to God, well, now, why did you do this? And how did you do that? And he would explain it to us. <laughs> Heavenly Father, why are the leaves green? And he would say, because of the chlorophyll. And we'd say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> But in the Hindu universe, you would say to God, how did you make the mountains? And he would say, well, I just did it. Because what you're asking me for, when you ask me, how did I make the mountains? You're asking me to describe in words how I made the mountains. And there are no words which can do this. Words cannot tell you how I made the mountains any more than I can drink the ocean with a fork. A fork may be useful for sticking into a piece of something and eating it, but it won't, it is, it's no use for, for, for imbibing the ocean. It would take millions of years. So it would take millions of years. In other words, you would be bored with my description long before I got through it, if I put it to you in words. Because I didn't create the mountains with words. I just did it. Like you open and close your hand. You know how to do this, but can you describe in words how you do it? But you do it. You are conscious, aren't you? Do you know how you manage to be conscious? Do you know how you beat your heart? Can you say in words, explain correctly how this is done? You do it, but you can't put it into words. Because words are too clumsy. And yet you manage this expertly for as long as you're able to do it. This concludes session one of Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening, from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Our program continues with session two. We are playing a game, and the game runs like this. The only thing you really know is what you can put into words. Let's suppose I love some girl, rapturously. And somebody says to me, would you really love her? Well, how am I going to prove this? Well, say, uh, write poetry. Tell us all how much you love her, then we'll believe you. So if I'm an artist and I can put this into words and convince everybody that I've written the most ecstatic love letters ever written, they say, all right, okay, we, we'll admit it, you really do love her. But supposing you're not very articulate, are we going to tell you you don't love her? Surely not. You don't have to be Heloise and Abelard to be in love. So the whole game that our culture is playing is that nothing really happens unless it's in the newspaper. So we're, when we are at a party, 
and there's a great party somebody said it's too bad there wasn't a tape recorder and so our children begin to feel that they don't exist authentically unless they get their names in the papers and the fastest way of getting your name in the papers is to commit a crime and then you'll be photographed then you'll appear in court and everybody will notice you it really happened if it was recorded in other words if you shout and it doesn't doesn't come back an echo it didn't happen well that's a real hang-up it's true, the fun with echoes. We all like singing in the bathtub because there's more resonance there. And when we play a musical instrument like a violin or a cello, it has a sounding box because that gives resonance to the sound. And in the same way, the cortex of the human brain enables us when we are happy to know that we are happy. And that gives a certain resonance to it. If you're happy and you don't know you're happy, there's nobody home. <laughs> But this is the whole problem for us. <laughs> Several thousand years ago, human beings evolved the system of self-consciousness. And uh, they knew, they, they knew. There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the eye that knows me when I know that I know that I know. You see? And, and this is uh, the human problem. We know that we know. And so there came a point in our evolution when we didn't guide life by just trusting our instincts and had to think about it and had to purposely arrange and discipline and push our lives around in accordance with foresight and words and systems of symbols, accountancy, calculation, and so on and then we worry once you start thinking about things you worry as to whether you've thought enough did you really take all the details into consideration was every fact properly reviewed and by Jove the more you think about it the more you realize that uh, you really couldn't take everything into consideration because all the variables in any human decision are incalculable so you get anxiety and this, though, also, this is the price you pay for knowing that you know, for being able to think about thinking, to feel about feeling. And so you're in this funny position. Now then, do you see that this is simultaneously an advantage and a terrible disadvantage? What has happened here is that by having a certain kind of consciousness, a certain kind of reflexive consciousness, being aware of being aware, being able to represent what goes on fundamentally in terms of a system of symbols, such as words, such as numbers, you put as it were, two lives together at once, one representing the other. The symbols representing the reality, the money representing the wealth. And if you don't realize that the symbol is really secondary, it doesn't have the same value. You know, people go to the supermarket and they uh, get a whole cartload of goodies and they drive it through. And then the clerk fixes up the counter and this long tape comes out. And you say, $30, please. And everybody feels depressed. Because they, they give away $30 worth of paper. But they've got a cartload of goodies. And they don't think about that. They think they just lost, lost $30. But you've got the real wealth in the cart. All you parted with was the paper. Because the paper in our system becomes more valuable than the wealth. It represents power, potentiality, whereas the wealth, you think, oh well, that's just necessary. You've got to eat. Well, I mean, that's to be really mixed up. So then.
If you awaken from this illusion and you understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or shall I say, death implies life, you can feel yourself not as a stranger in the world, not as something here on probation, not as something that has arrived here by fluke, but you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. What you are basically, deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. So, say in Hindu mythology, they say that the world is the drama of God. God is not something in Hindu mythology with a white beard that, that sits on a throne and that has royal prerogatives. God in, in Indian mythology is the self, Satchitananda, which means Sat, that which is, Chit, that which is consciousness, that which is Ananda is bliss. And in other words, re, the, the, what exists, reality itself is gorgeous. It is the plenum, the fullness of total joy. Wow, we. And all those stars, if you look out in the sky, as a firework display, like you see on the 4th of July, which is a great occasion for celebration. The universe is a celebration. It is a firework show to celebrate that existence is. Wow, we. And then they say, but however, there's no point just in sustaining bliss. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the Godhead, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. The first thing he says to himself is, man, get lost because he gives himself away. The nature of love is self-abandonment, not clinging to oneself, throwing yourself out, as in, for example, in basketball, you're always getting rid of the ball. You say to the other fellow, have a ball, see? And uh, that, that keeps things moving. That's the nature of life. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality, not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is, and you're all that, only you're pretending you're not. And it's perfectly okay to pretend you're not, to be absolutely convinced, because this is the whole notion of drama. When you come into the theatre, 
there is a proscenium arch and a stage and down there is the audience and everybody assumes their seats in the theater and uh, are going to see a comedy, a tragedy, a thriller, or whatever it is. And they all know, as they come in and pay their admissions, that what is going to happen on the stage is not for real. But the actors have a conspiracy against this, because they are going to try and persuade the audience that what is happening on the stage is for real. They want to get everybody sitting on the edge of their chairs. They want to get you terrified, or crying, or laughing. Ab absolutely captivated by the drama. And if a skillful human actor can take in an audience and make people cry, think what the cosmic actor can do. Why, he can take himself in completely. He can play so much for real that he really believes it is. Like you sitting in this room, you think you're really here. Why, you've persuaded yourself that way. You've acted it so damn well that you know this is the real world but you're playing it. It's because the audience and the actor is one. Because behind the stage, there's the green room. Off scene, obscene. Where the actors take off their masks. You know that the word person means mask? The persona, which is the mask worn by actors in Greco-Roman drama because it has a megaphone type mouth which throws the sound out in an open air theater. So pair through sonar, what the sound comes through, that's the mask. How to be a real person, how to be a genuine fake. A mask. So the dramatis personae at the beginning of a play is the list of masks that the actors will wear. And so in the course of forgetting that this this life is a drama, the word for the role, the word for the mask, has come to mean who you are genuinely, the person, the proper person. Incidentally, the word parson is derived from the word person. The person of the village, the person around town, the parson. It's funny. So anyway then, this is the drama. I'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it. I want you to play with it. I want you to think of its possibilities. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about. So then, this means that you're not victims of a scheme of things, of a mechanical world or of an autocratic god. The life you're living is what you have put yourself into. Only you don't admit it because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. In other words, I got mixed up in this world. My parents, I had a father who got hot pants over a girl and she was my mother. And uh, because he got, the, he, was just a, he was just a horny old man. And as a result of that, I got born. And I blame him for it and say, well, that's your fault. You've got to look after me. And he says, I don't see why I should look after you. You're just a result. <laughs> and, but let's suppose we admit that I really wanted to get born and that I was the ugly gleam in my father's eye when he approached my mother. That was me. I was desire. And I deliberately got involved in this thing. Look at it that way instead. And that even if I got myself into an awful mess, and I got born with syphilis and the great Siberian itch and tuberculosis and uh, in a Nazi concentration camp, nevertheless, this was a game which was a very far out play. It was a kind of cosmic masochism. But I did it. Isn't that an optimal game rule for life? Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on, it's a drag. 
there's no point in going on living unless we make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal. That really and truly we are all in a state of total bliss and delight. But we are going to pretend we aren't just for kicks. You play non-bliss in order to be able to experience bliss. And you can go as far out as non-bliss as you want to go. And when you wake up, it'll be great. You know, you can slam yourself on the head with a hammer because it's so nice when you stop. And it makes you realize, you see, how, how great things are when you forget that that's the way it is. And that's just like black and white. You don't know black unless you know white. You don't know white unless you know black. This is simply fundamental. So then, here's the drama. My metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the central self. You can call it God, you can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farthest out adventures, but in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say, this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye and says, oh, come off it. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe or I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, and the guru looks at you and says, who are you? You know, Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage of modern times, people used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? As if that mattered. And he would say, who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, basically, go right down to it. You're looking at me, you're looking out, and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes. Go back in and find out who you are, where the question comes from, why you ask. And if you've looked at a photograph of that man, I have a gorgeous photograph of him. And you look in those, I walk by it every time I go out of the front door. And I look at those eyes and the humor, the lilting laugh that says, oh, come off it, man. <laughs> Shiva, I recognize you. When you come to my door and you say, I'm so-and-so, I say, ha ha, what a funny way God has come on today. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of tricks, of course, that gurus play. They uh, say, well, we're going to put you through the mill. And the reason they do that is simply that you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. In other words, the sense of guilt that one has, or the sense of anxiety, is simply the way one experiences keeping the game of disguise going on. Do you see that? Supposing you say, I feel guilty. Christianity makes you feel guilty for existing. That somehow, the very fact that you exist is an affront. 
you are a fallen human being. I remember as a child when we went to the services of the church on Good Friday, they gave us each a colored postcard with Jesus crucified on it. And it said underneath, this have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You know, you felt off. You have nailed that man to the cross. Because you eat steak, you have crucified Christ. Because you've killed the bull. After all, you depend on him. Mithra, it's the same mystery. And what are you going to do about that? This have I done for thee. What doest thou for me? You feel awful that you just exist at all. But that sense, that sense of guilt is the veil across the sanctuary. Don't you dare come in. In order to, you know, in all mysteries, when you're going to be initiated, there's somebody saying, ah, 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 don't you come in. You've got to fulfill this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, then we'll let you in. And so you go, you, you go through the mill. Why? Because this is, you're saying to yourself, I won't wake up until I feel I deserve it. I won't wake up until I've made it difficult for me to wake up. So I, I, I invent for myself an elaborate system of delaying my waking up. I put myself through this test and that test, and when I feel it's been sufficiently arduous, then I may at last admit to myself who I really am and draw aside the veil and realize that after all, when all is said and done, I am that I am, which is the name of God. And when it comes to it, that's really rather funny. They say in Zen, when you attain Satori, nothing is left to you at that moment but to have a good laugh. But naturally, uh, all masters, Zen masters, yoga masters, every kind of master, uh, puts up a barrier and says to you, He simply plays your own game. You know, we say anybody who goes to a psychiatrist ought to have his head examined. Because you, when you go to a psychiatrist, you define yourself as somebody who ought to have his head examined. Same way, uh, the Zen masters say anybody